everybody. Happy Thursday. Glad to see many of you are back for the second round session of using art in the social studies classroom. Um, here at Science of Math, we just got off to a new term uh, this week, and they're actually filming a, a movie on campus today with Colin Firth and um, Emily Blunt. Uh, called Arthur Newman Golf Pro. So our students have been all up in arms. Have you seen Colin? Have you met Emily? Um, so it's been an exciting day on NCSSM's campus. Um, and I hope that you've had an exciting week of uh, attempting to implement art in your classrooms or uh, some of you are art teachers who are implementing social studies concepts into your classrooms. And I received um, homework assignments from four of you. Um, so we're going to start the day by hearing about your experiences with using art um, and or social studies in your classrooms this week. Um, so I got an assignment from um, Leanne Means, an assignment from Linda McDermott, an assignment from Henry Moss, and an assignment from Christy Moody. Um, so I have your pictures, your visual aids, that I can put up on the screen for everybody else to see. Um, and I would just love to, to have you volunteer. Does anybody want to talk about um, their lesson? Tell us what you did and, and how it went. Who want, Does anybody want to start? Of the four who, who sent me? Um, oh. Well, let's let's first hear, I guess, who we've got here. So, who is joining us from Hertford County High School? That's me right here, John Johnson. John Johnson. Hi. Okay. Yes. Um, is anybody at Warren County? The room looks empty on the screen. Okay. Um, who else is with us? Chatham County, and we sent in lesson plans to Carol Stern because it was not clear to us where to send them, and oh, okay. so you may not have gotten them yet. I didn't get them, and Carol's actually off campus for a conference, um, so I didn't get them, but that doesn't mean that you can't share them. It just means I don't have visual aids to put up on the screen. So we'll definitely um, hear from you guys. Who else? We actually have some visual aids with us. Oh, great. So. so you can maybe hold them up to the camera. That would be perfect. Right. All right. Do you um, want us to wait? Um, yeah, well, let's just hear who else we've got and then we'll we'll start. So who else is with us today? Nashville came out. Okay. Um, are Leanne, Linda, Henry, or Krista here? Yes, I'm oh. Leanne. Oh, okay, great. So I got yours. Okay, good. What about Linda or Henry or Krista? No, you're not going to that. Oh, okay. No, it, it was actually, it was fine. I, I went well. Linda and Henry are here. Okay, great. All right. So um, who would like to go first um, in talking about, I just want you to describe to everybody what you did, and then I want to talk about how it went, how you, what you feel like the students learned, um, you know, did the students engage with the art or with the social studies concepts? Um, do you feel like that it was a, a good thing to integrate those two curricular areas in your classroom? So who'd like to go first? Okay, great. So we'll have um, our folks who are going to hold their, their visual aids up to the screen for us. Um, so this is Elizabeth Deaton and I, and we collaborated. She's the history teacher and I'm the art teacher. And um, we had some ideas. We met a couple of different times. We had some ideas for um, collaborating with a newspaper, interject if you need to, um, newspaper for the helping to get across what started the Civil War. And so um, Elizabeth came to my class and taught my students about Fort Sumter. And then we came up with this concept to, um, I don't know if you can see it, but we've got three little squares across the top and three little squares across the bottom where we actually drew comic strips on aged paper and made it look old. And um, we decided to get across 
the concepts of the starting of the war, so the setting of the war, Fort Sumter, Lincoln's decision um, in whether or not to bring ships, um, bringing supplies into the fort, and then the Confederates um, attacking the uh, the Confederates attacking the Federal soldiers at Fort Sumter, then the battle, and then the um, the victor. Um, and then we have like a little um, handout sheet um, that talked about the Civil War. Um, uh, pretty close. <laughs> yeah. And um, gave them a, a fact, fill in the blank type sheet. And then on the back was the cartoon um, listing assignment for the students, almost kind of rubric like, so that they would know what to do. We gave them a um, setting of what was important in showing the context of what art they were getting ready por to portray. And so we had them do some research on, um, this was an example that one of my students did for me, of a Confederate soldier, just a simple drawing. And they looked up on the computers um, some artifacts that may have been good for um, telling the viewer uh, what the setting was. And so we brainstormed ideas for that as well. And then we learned about how to storyboard we decided that, um, let's see, sorry. Uh, we decided that one comic wasn't enough and that we needed to be able to have several visuals to um, portray a story um, in sequence through time, um, that that would be easier. So, and then here's an example I, of one of the students' work. Um, to call back into the broadcast. Sorry about that, guys. We got a little technical difficulty here. Let's see if they'll come back. To, not everyone, just the folks that have frozen, we're going to have to hang up and call back so that we can um, get the broadcast to start working with you again. Thank you. Jordan Matthews, can you hear us? Okay. things with distance education. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to keep trying to get um, Jordan Matthews back. So let's actually move on to another group and we'll pick up where we left off with them when they're able to rejoin the broadcast. Do we have another um, group or another teacher that like to volunteer to share what they did? No volunteers? Oh, Okay, great. Um, well, today um, I actually used a song um, called 
big yellow taxi to go over and review the difference between a trade-off and an opportunity cost with my students. That's great. And you sent me um, your assignment sheet, and I actually have it so I can put it up on the screen for everybody. Okay. Um, can you do that? Great. Okay, so okay. let me zoom in on these so everybody can see. Uh, so what class are you teaching, Krista? I teach civics and econ, and right now we are uh, just beginning our discussion about making economic decisions and how to um, weigh opportunity costs, look at marginal costs, fixed costs, and, uh, and uh, total costs. Okay, and so you have 10th graders, and right. you're working right. within the standard course of study, and, and you're headed toward a, an EOC test, right? No, not this year. Oh, not this year, right. Because not this year. All the changes, but typically you are. Right, right. Okay. Um, go, okay. go right ahead. Okay, so basically um, this was used uh, as a means to go over and review opportunity costs. We talked about it in the realm of making economic decisions as far as them making decisions with their money. So I wanted to kind of put a little twist on it and help them to think about opportunity costs and um, another realm, which in this case is, was about our environment. <clears throat> so I actually played the song for them. And as the song played along, some of them had he heard it before. So they started to hum along and sing along with it, with you know reading the, the lyrics at the same time listening to the music. And once the music stopped, we talked about the main idea, what was going on, what happened um, in each one of the stanzas. And then we actually took it to, uh, connect it to the opportunity costs and the trade-offs that we had been talking about earlier in the week. Great, and so I see on the second part of your worksheet, you had discussion questions that they would have known about as they were listening to the song and reading right. the lyrics. Um, right. And then you had them break it down into stanzas and talk about the trade-offs, the opportunity cost uh, in the lyrics. And then you had them make a personal connection. Did they right. agree or disagree, which I think is great. And right. then you, you moved on and you had them make a business plan. Is that right? Yeah, they've been working on a business plan for about a week and it has five parts. So. The opportunity cost section deals with um, what opportunity costs they will have to make for their business. What other kinds of costs will they have? And it kind of connected uh, what we had talked about earlier in the week, connected the song with it, and then made them apply it to their own business plan. That's great. And you had this chart on the fourth page um, that talked about the, um, like you're showing all of the different ways that this ties in with your standards, right, which I think right. is great. Um, right. So how do you think it went? I think it went fairly well. I think they were excited to uh, actually get to do something new. We had never used any music before in my class, so that was kind of interesting. Um, and like I said before, some of them were familiar with the song. Thank you. So it made uh, a big difference for them. Do you feel like, um, you know, one of the readings that we read for our first session was all about how music really helps students engage because they find it more relevant. Do you right. feel like that was the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I, for myself, I think that I can use music to relate to them. And I think that that would uh, kind of engage them more so than me putting up a, a portrait or, you know, putting up a, a, a scene or anything. I think I can grab them better with using that music. That's why I chose to use music with them. And how difficult was it for you to find a, a song that would match up with your course concepts? Wow. <laughs> it took me a while. Uh -huh. It did. It took me a while. Um, just based on a lot of internet research, um, just thinking about different songs that I knew myself and thinking about what we were talking about as far as the standard course of study is concerned. It took me a few days to find something. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
I know that in college I had an economics professor who regularly played the tax man by the Beatles. Uh -huh. um, that would be my go-to for, for an economics-themed song. Um, right. but, but I imagine it's kind of hard when you're talking about those, those sort of more abstract principles to come up with a work of art or um, a, a piece of music that really matches. Do you feel like the investment in finding that artwork or, or piece of music was worthwhile? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I feel like they connected the concept a little better. For those who were a little cloudy on what an opportunity cost was or what a trade-off was, they made that connection with this song. Great. And so I kind of brought along those who were lagging behind with, you know, understanding the concepts. That's exciting. That's great. It is. It is. Awesome. So do you have anything else you want to share with us? Um, I... I think that's it. Okay. It sounds like you had a really positive outcome and even though it was it was challenging to, yeah. to find something that would work for your curriculum, it, it paid off. So that's yeah. great. Absolutely. All right. Um, who else would like to, to volunteer to share? Okay. okay. Henry? Great. So I will um, pull up what I have. Oh. So um, tell us a little bit about what you did, Henry. <laughs> okay, I first started by using the uh, Paul Revere uh, reproduction in the collection of Picture in America. And this is a copy of the last time I think everyone had a chance to see it. I first told them a little bit about Paul Revere's life and also that he was a politician. And I had the kids kind of look at this picture very carefully to see if they saw something in the picture. Yeah. Was, uh, so, Henry, you have second graders, right? Yeah, I have second graders. Okay. And I'm the art teacher. Right. Yes, kindergarten through fifth. Yeah, I have, that's, that's true. So I showed them this reproduction, and I have a collection of these in the hall of the school, and it shows that all of these pictures were uh, painted by American artists. It says, a picture, picture in America. Right, and so one of the readings them, you guys had was Picturing America, part of that NEH program. Great. Right. Uh -huh. So I use this as uh, kind of like an introduction into portrait drawing. And then the next thing I did was talk about the life of Paul Revere and also that he was a silversmith and that his father also was a silversmith and that he learned a lot of that uh, by being um, a person who learned of his father. And I showed them some of the delicate tools that did intricate designs as the dentist would use in a person's mouth. Oh, some of the kids aren't really familiar with the, the term silversmith but they're uh, familiar with dentistry, you know, like going to the dentist on a regular basis. So uh, I had the kids think about the word stage. When something is staged, like when we take our school pictures, a lot of the kids dress up real nice. And then they stay dressed for a while, then they put them on their play clothes for recess. So I told them that uh, Paul Revere, you know, he had on this very nice vest with gold buttons and the tables of mahogany desk with these tie, uh, tiny tools. And then he had his hand underneath his chin very similar to the Rodin statue of the thinker. And I asked them what did they first think when they saw a person with their, <laughs> with their hand under their chin, and they thought, well, that person is this a due concentration. They looked at this portrait, and the first thing they thought was that he was looking very serious, but he was looking directly at them as if to deliver a message. And so I gave them a little overview about the revolution and the, that his big line, the British, were coming. And uh, I talked a little bit about that. And then we focused on folding a sheet of paper because I wanted to know that a fraction and math should not be intimidating. So I used this, I used bigger sheets of paper for them. But I just took this one sheet of paper, I'm just showing you this now, and we folded it in half. And then we folded it again, and then we folded it again, and I asked them how many sections do they think were going to be in this thing. So they said the first thing they knew would be half, like taking a piece of the dot, you know, cutting it in the middle and then cutting it again, and that would be a four, and then you went on. And so they had to count all these little squares, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, then they had, uh, you know, eight squares. Then they drew an oval shape, and then they drew a neck shape, and the middle line had to be where the eyes would uh, intersect, going across. And that the ears, I showed them through a ruler, that the ears would always be a little bit taller than the eye, the corner of the eye. So they had to um, take their index finger and thumb, 
and measure this distance, that would be one, two, three, four, five. So we knew five eyes could go across the front of the face, but we only needed two. So we had to leave a space on this side and a space on this side to allow for the two eyes that had to have a space in the middle where the nose would go. So this is what we came up with. Um, I'll show you a portrait. Okay. And we use uh, tempera paints. This picture looks doesn't look so well on the screen. But uh, this picture was done the same way, folded and folded in half. And then the children outlined their pencil lines with black tempera paint. And I wanted to know that tempera paint was a totally different medium than a pencil or a watercolor because tempera paint is opaque and light can't travel through it. So they had, you know, like one of the standards is, are children exposed to different media? So I wanted to know we started with a pencil, we went to paint, <laughs> and then, you know, this is how it turned out. So they had to use an array of different colors. And the, some of our vocabulary words, like in the lesson, were um, like opposite, opaque, transparent, contrast, and background. They had to come up at the end with lines either vertical or horizontal. And they had to know which way a vertical line went. And I said, a vertical line is normally a line where a person stands. And a horizontal would be a line probably where, people, where a person would sleep at night. So they had to know if it was going to be a sleeping line or a standing line. <laughs> so that's how they came up with the background lines. Uh -huh. So these are done by second grade students, but the message was the portrait of Paul Revere and then their original portrait drawings, not from a specific person across from them, just by putting things within proportion and using math and social studies as the avenues that led to this lesson. So how did you feel about integrating, because you actually pulled in two other curricula into your work. How did you feel about doing that? Well, I, you know, I don't want kids to think that art is being taught in total isolation. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, when they come into the art room, if I know something about Paul Revere, they figure I'm a mind reader. <laughs> you know, if they figure that I know something about, um, you know, dimensions, that I know something about math. And then, you know, sometimes, Math is intimidating to students because it's kind of taught on a very structured, but if you just fold a piece of paper and talk about a slice of pizza, it kind of like makes them a little more comfortable to just cut it and divide it, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so you feel like it was of great benefit to, as you said, take math sort of out of, I mean, take art out of isolation and add in other concepts, right? Oh yeah, it's always, it's, and it is always important, like when I showed this Paul Revere, uh, Reproduction. I also showed a, a, a picture of Jacob Lawrence, who was an African American artist, and right. his wife Gwen Lawrence, because I want the kids to know that there are different rays of uh, culture within artists when they paint portraits. It's not all isolated to one style of one person. Right. I saw in your lesson plan where you talked about how showing diversity um, when you talked yeah. about skin tone with the paint. So I think that's great. That's certainly a social studies concept. Um, so well, you know, when I used the, the uh, social studies, I thought about skin color and cultures, and when I used the skin colors and different other colors, I thought about this, the art of mixing colors as a science method, you know, like mixing this color and this color. You know, and you can use little tiny spoons, and they could just put two, one spoon of this with white or orange or brown, and just experiment with the tones to see what you may be pleased with. That sounds great. Do you have anything okay. else you want to add, Henry? No, that's it. Okay, great. Um, who'd like to yeah, go next? Yeah, the legs were running around, but it's not like right. dangerous or anything. Right. I can go ahead and do my little quickie. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Linda, and um, I teach the computer lab, so I didn't think this would really fit as well, but I was trying to look for some ways to bring in uh, other things, like you said, other than to just teach technology so uh, or, or a computer. So uh, our students in uh, fifth grade were doing projects on Native Americans, and since we're on, I only see them every 12 days this year instead of every week, uh, I, I cut the project quite a bit and made it so that they're only researching one thing about uh, one particular uh, group of Native Americans, whether it's the uh, Southeast, the North, uh, the Northwest, the Plains, uh, whichever group they had, they would just be looking for one uh, research item. 
uh, like homes or food or clothing or um, travel, government, religion, just one particular small object. So they were an item. So they would be researching that. Then they uh, came up with their little paragraph. And we were going to put it in a Vokey. So uh, to make it into this, to add it to this project, we had them go to the Smithsonian American Art Museum online and use their uh, really nice web search tool to do, uh, to, to look for those specific uh, Native Americans and then be able to um, find uh, pictures, paintings. Most of them were photographs. They have a lot of objects, but we decided not to use the objects. Uh, so we used the photographs mostly, and uh, I did it today, and it went okay. I always do better the second time I teach that lesson. <laughs> and I learned a lot from it. We had some, some difficulties with computers. Some could log in easily to their new Bokey login and some not. But uh, they did all find at least uh, one photograph to uh, write about and see if it what they could, uh, using your techniques of what do you think the uh, author or the painter or the photographer was trying to say with this uh, picture, and uh, it needed to be concise, like three to five or six sentences, because Vokey only lets you put in a small amount, and that's just a Web 2.0 tool that lets them create an avatar. Um, right, that right. It could be an animal, a person, or something. Can we pull it up? I've actually got um, the Vokey website pulled up so you can see what it looks okay, like. Okay, cool. Um, Vokey's really cool. I've used it before. Um, and it lets you create an avatar um, kind of like if you've ever used like a Nintendo Wii. Um, it lets you put together a face with different features <laughs> like um, hair, you know, different hair colors and hairstyles and glasses and, you know, different shaped noses and mouths and skin tones and um, then you get to put text in, you get to choose a voice tone, and the avatar will speak your text, right? Is that a pretty good description, Linda? Yes, excellent. Um, and um, Linda's lesson was to use this website from the National Museum of the American Indian, which is part of the Smithsonian. And so they went in to this collection, found a work of art from the American Indians, um, to talk about and then and build to Vokey, which I just think is a really great fusion of um, what you do, which is teach computer skills with um, social studies concepts. So I think that's great. You feel like it didn't go as well as it could go in the future just because of the technical difficulties? Uh, yes, it was my first time. These kids were, were planning on making a Vokey anyway about their uh, Indian culture. But uh, this class was going to get to do the extra one on the art, and I thought, no, I need to let everybody try it. But this is the very first class that, that got to do it at all, because we have just started moving from the research into the other part of the project. So it went okay, and I can see where I can make improvements. Uh, mostly is uh, just some, you know, teacher things of having their little index cards, handing them out to them as they come in the room uh, for their logins. It's a pretty difficult login, but they can handle it, and um, I'm always more pleased with my second or third time teaching something. I think every teacher can identify with that feeling. Um, do you feel like adding in a social studies concept was a benefit? Uh, yes, uh, I tried, like Henry, not to, not to just teach uh, technology, because if, in elementary school, since everybody teaches everything, we need to follow up with what the classroom teachers are doing. So this was part of what they were doing in their classroom and they wanted us to enhance on it. And I just added your art section to it. And actually, I think I'm going to like that better because I think it drives out more thinking skills, more uh, higher level thinking skills. And uh, what, you know, what you think they're trying to say, not just you do some research and you type it in and copy it and paste it into your Vokey. That's great. So I think it is doing more actually. That's great. Yeah, I think um, as you said, sometimes visual documents are a li little bit easier for students to access when they're thinking in an interdisciplinary way. So they were able to use analysis skills while practicing their technology skills while dealing with the content from their social studies curriculum, which I think is, is awesome. Um, it's great that you had 
at least what, what may in future prove to be a really positive experience once you get the little kinks worked out. All right, um, it looks like our broadcast just hooked back in with NAS, Nash Central um, just in time. Um, do you want to go ahead and share with us what you were able to do? Okay, sure. Um, my name is Wendy Ferguson and um, I teach art uh, K-5 in two different schools every day. Um, Red Oak is, is K-2 and uh, Swift Creek is 3-5. to five. In my Red Oak uh, Grade 1 class, we've been looking at um, Native American Indian art as a way of um, explaining the first Thanksgiving. And so what I did was we looked at a variety of different Indian masks and um, I'm sorry I didn't bring examples, I will next time. That's okay. And uh, we looked at the various uh, Indian symbols and how to use them. We had done some, I'm Australian, so we did some comparisons of Aboriginal symbols and Native American symbols and different cultural styles which fitted in with the um, objective of explaining the importance of folklore celebrations and their impact on... Oh no, have we frozen again? Different masks on different totem poles and different Native American Indian things and um, so they were doing three-headed masks and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it was really a very exciting lesson and I really feel that I pushed the bar by, you know, talking about the cultural differences. Right, so it sounds like you got sort of the double whammy of not only bringing in social studies concepts by studying Native American cultures, but being able to do the comparison of the two different um, Native cultures of the Aborigines and then um, Natives to, to North America. So I think that's really interesting. Um, what do you feel like the greatest benefit of incorporating social studies concepts into your you. lesson was? Oh, I, I just asked, what do you feel like the greatest benefit of incorporating social studies concepts into your art lesson was? Uh oh. Okay, so we might have to, to hold on there and um, follow up with them in a minute. Did we lose our other site? The Jordan, Jordan Matthews. Oh, okay. Okay. So it looks like we've we've lost Jordan Matthews due to an internet outage, um, and Nash Central is having a little bit of trouble holding on to their connection. Um, so. It's just from what you guys have shared. Oh, here we go. We got our connection back. Are you able to hear us now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So I just had one follow-up question. I said, um, what do you feel the what the greatest benefit of incorporating social studies concept into your lesson was? Well, I, I just feel it gives them that depth of understanding. Um, of, you know, so many of our children have never been anywhere or done anything, and so by exposing them to some of the social studies concepts, they get an idea of, of the world. And I mean, I've traveled the world, so, you know, I have that, um, and of course, you know, I've talked to different countries, so that gives me a, a different pet perspective, and I really feel that they need to understand that there's so many different ways of doing the same thing. Right, and it, I, you know, students always appreciate when teachers bring their own personal perspectives into the classroom. So um, I'm sure that it was interesting for them that you called on your heritage as someone from Australia. Um, they always find that more relevant somehow when teachers bring in right. some aspect of their personal identity. So I think well, that's great. <laughs> so, and looking at symbols through that. So yeah, it all ties in together. That's great. All right, well, um, for everybody that's logged in, we have shared. I thought that I would share one more lesson of mine with you. Um, and this is a lesson that incorporates um, a lot. It incorporates music, and it incorporates lots of different um,
forms of art. Um, it's a two-day lesson, um, and it's from when I teach the mid-20th century, so the 1950s. So I'm dealing with really two concepts when I teach this lesson. Uh, I'm dealing with the uh, increasing conformity in the 1950s through things like suburbanization that really comes after World War II. Um, and I'm dealing with the effect that that has on women's roles. So I spend one day on rising conformity. So there's only the three of it. And I spend one day oh on um, on the women's roles, and I want to show you what I do, just so you can get a different a sense of how maybe you can incorporate different forms of art across several days of content. Um, so the first thing that I start with um, is a song, um, and I want to show you the lyrics, and then I will I will play the song for you. Um, so this song is. Um, Little Boxes. It's by a folk singer named Malvina Reynolds. Um, and she was actually driving in San Francisco um, and she saw all of the neighborhoods to the side and they all looked very similar. And so she told her husband, take the wheel, I feel a song coming on. And, and she wrote the song. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it for you now. Find it. There it is. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes made of ticky tacky. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one. And they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university where they were put in boxes and they came out all the same. And there's doctors and lawyers and business executives and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And they all play on the golf course and drink their martinis dry and they all pretty children and the children go to school and the children go to summer camp and then to the university where they are put in boxes and they come out all the same and the boys go into business and marry and raise a family in boxes made of ticky tacky and they all look just the same there's a pink one and a green one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same okay um so at this point um i would have students analyze the lyrics of the song and also um the way that the song is constructed so let's talk about that first did you notice any pattern in the music that backed the lyrics? Did anybody notice anything? It was meant to sound like a music box that's slowly winding down. And you can sort of hear that in the cadence of the music. Um, and in the lyrics, we get to talk about the notions of conformity um, so she talks about how everybody goes to the colleges and so the colleges sort of pump out lawyers and doctors and business executives and the people live in all the same houses that look like little boxes um, and they raise children to grow up just the same as them. Um, and we get to talk about the notion of what ticky tacky means and so I have students think about why she would use that term. It's not a real term. She sort of come up with this name for what she sees as conformity as, as a negative thing. And so to tie this into a social studies concept, um, in American history, one of the things that we talk about is the issue of housing um, following World War II. Following World War II, because of the GI Bill, there was this big, big surge for housing because the GI Bill enabled all those soldiers coming home from the war to be able to buy a house when they never could before because the federal government would guarantee their loans. And so one of the ways that that housing was provided 
was by mass producing subdivisions in suburban areas. And one of the, the places most famous for that is Levittown. Um, so these are pictures of Levittown communities that were built on Long Island and near Philadelphia in the late 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and so students get to see the photographs of what real neighborhoods would have looked like in the 1950s, um, see how all the lots are the same sizes, and see how they really do end up looking sort of like the little boxes in Malvina Reynolds' song, um, and how um, there's very little change between the different types of houses. So we actually get to talk a little bit about architecture concepts um, when we talk about Levittown. So that's another sort of type of art that we get to address here. Um, and we talk about what kinds of effects this kind of standardization might have on society. So, um, you know, if everybody is living in a house that looks the same, if everybody is going to the same schools and learning the same values, if everybody's experiencing the same media stimuli, um, what kinds of pressures that might put on a society in terms of conformity. Um, and then the next day, we move on to talk about women um, and what effect this has on women. Because contrary to popular belief, you know, we have that notion of the perfect 1950s family that we sort of get from Leave It to Beaver, right? Of June Cleaver, um, you know, at home and her husband going out um, and the kids who are sheltered by this woman who's very much in the domestic sphere. Um, and in fact, more and more women are going um, to the workplace in the 1950s. And so we sort of deal with that paradox. Um, and what I do is I have a set of images, and we're going to go to the document camera now. I have a set of images that actually don't just show women's roles over time. I mean, sorry, in the 1950s, they show women's roles over time. So um, I have these laminated images that include um, cartoons, that include magazine covers, propaganda posters, photographs, and these are all from the 1920s when women got the right to vote up through the 1950s. I hand these out at random to groups at the beginning of the class and I tell them to be prepared to um, talk about them um, if I call on them. So I say that I'm going to, I let them know first of all that they're going to have to talk, they're going to have to participate in class discussion, but I give them advanced warning so that they're prepared and they have something good to say about their topic. Um, and I ask them to take, you know, a few minutes, maybe five minutes, and they can talk about it with their neighbors around them. Think about what the image conveys about uh, women and their role in American society. And I ask them actually to hypothesize, to predict what I gave them this image for, what purpose I had in giving this, them this image. And so that really gets them thinking and engaging with um, how they might use, uh, or how I might be making curricular decisions. Um, so I actually go in order, um, and I start with the 1920s. Um, this is my first image. This is an image of a woman suffragette protesting in front of the White House, um, attempting to get the right to vote for women. And so you can see she's standing in front of the White House holding a banner that says, Kaiser Wilson, have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your own eye. Um, so, does anybody know why the women's suffragettes called Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, Kaiser Wilson? Wilson is president during World War I when we're fighting the Germans. The Germans are led by the Kaiser. So this is a really audacious mm -hmm. protest on the part of women <laughs> who are um, really calling out the American president for hypocrisy. Um, so you can really see how bold women are in the 19 teens when they're asserting that they deserve the right to vote. Um, so then I move on to uh, a second image, if I could find it. 
Um, this is a cartoon from the 1920s. It was a, a frequently run cartoon in newspapers syndicated across the country by a cartoonist named Paul Robinson. It's called Just Among Us Girls. That's the name of the cartoon series. Um, and you can see there's a woman in a fairly skimpy bathing suit for the time period um, being quite flirtatious, right? Riding on the shoulders of a young man on a water ski. And she seems to also be applying makeup, which is a sure sign that she's a flapper. And I know it's hard to read the text in this, but she said, um, the, the boy in the picture asks, who's your father gonna vote for this fall? And she responds, I don't know, mama hasn't made up his mind yet. Um, so you can see again, women are in, in this image, not only embracing this new right to vote and asserting their voice in the political sphere, but um, they are you know, wearing less uh, clothing, revealing more skin. They're um, wearing cosmetics, which is a brand new notion in the 1920s. It's quite scandalous. Before this, only prostitutes wore makeup. Um, so um, we can see that women really make great strides in the 19-teens and 1920s when first they demand the right to vote, and then they really change the way that they dress and the way that they behave in public and really embrace new freedoms and, and new power. Um, so that takes us to the 1930s. This is an image um, that probably many of you are very familiar with. This is by a Depression era photographer who worked for the Farm Securities Administration, which was a New Deal program. And her name's Dorothea Lang. Um, and this is called Migrant Mother. Um, and Dorothea Lang traveled around in rural areas for the United States government to document the difficulties that agricultural workers were, were going through. Um, and so with this image, I like to talk to students about composition um, because what's really notable in this image is the woman in the center, the migrant mother. Um, and I talk to students about the decision to have the children of this woman in the image, but the decision to turn their faces away. And I ask them why Dorothea Lang might have asked them to turn their faces away. And very often they come up with what I'm hoping they come up with, which is, you know, children are very sympathetic figures. And if their faces were toward the camera, um, we might focus more on them. And what Lang is trying to exhibit, what she's trying to communicate is that the conditions of the Great Depression in American society have made being a mother, um, being what we all think of as, 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 you know, appropriate parenting, very, very difficult. And she doesn't know where the next meal for her children is going to be, and she can't provide, you know, adequate shelter um, and, and, you know, fulfill the needs of her children. And you can really see that in the lines of the woman's face and in, in the worry of her face. And this really, um, you know, is a stark contrast to this very carefree, sort of audacious and flirtatious image of the 1920s flapper. Um, next, we move to the 1940s, and of course, what dominates the 1940s is um, World War II. Um, and, and students are, are really prepared to, to talk about this because most of us have seen this image. Most of us have seen what's commonly referred to as Rosie the Riveter. Um, and we know that women entered the workplace during World War II to take the place of men who were fighting overseas so that our industries could remain productive. And this is certainly a statement of female strength, right? So she's flexing her muscles, she's wearing a work shirt, she's covered her hair, and she's declaring, we can do it. So this is definitely a girl power image, um, if we've ever seen one. Um, this one is also of interest. This is another propaganda poster from World War II, and I just want to zoom in on it a little bit. So it says, more nurses are needed. All women can help. Learn how you can aid in Army hospitals, U.S. Army Nurse Corps. And we see a woman, once again, in kind of typically male dress. You know, she's wearing a uniform. She has on a helmet. Um, and she's showing her distress, right? Um, you know, with the hand on the forehead, with the, the arm beckoning out, um, that she, more nurses are needed. 
but she's also showing what's depicted as a very um, important women's contribution. Nursing is typically a, a woman's occupation in this time period. And so we've got embedded in this, implied in this, the notion that women pl can play an integral role in helping to win the war. And so women can derive power from that notion. Um, let's see, I've got a couple more uh, images from World War II. This one's really interesting. Um, it says, be a cadet nurse, the girl with a future, a lifetime education free. So there's the notion here that women are important to the war effort because they're going to be nursing, but that if they contribute to that war effort, they're going to get an education that's going to give them a future career. And that's a really new concept for a lot of women who in previous decades have been confined to the domestic sphere, have been asked to fulfill household tasks. So they're being told, you can have a life outside of the home, you can make a really significant contribution to American society. Um, this one really gives a conflicting notion of women's roles in the war. So this poster really communicates to a male audience because it says he volunteered for submarine service. Um, and see, what he's getting out of his volunteerism is female attention, the attention of a beautiful woman. And the implied message to women then is that one of the ways they can contribute to the war is by offering their friendship um, and company to these heroic soldiers. Um, and so we still see women as sort of a, a sexual object in this image. But we've seen a lot of images of female power, of the female career and the female contribution to the war effort. And so women are, are getting new ideas from participation in the war. Um, then I move on to images from the 1950s that really show a return to that notion of women being confined to the domestic sphere. So this is a um, image, it's a cover from the Saturday Evening Post from 1955, and it shows a bridal shower. And the woman seems very excited to be receiving all of these nice household tools. So she seems to have an egg beater, and pots and pans, and a coffee pot, and a toaster, and a rolling pin. Um, and that seems to be something that's really exciting for her. Um, we also see um, this image, which I think is really interesting. Another Saturday Evening Post cover that shows that these are working women working in an office, sitting around a desk in the clothing of a professional woman in this time. She's probably a secretary. Um, but everybody has gathered around and they're excited because, I know it's hard to see, she's gotten engaged. And so even though she has a career, marriage seems to be the end goal. Um, moving on, we see this really interesting image from 1955, another Saturday Evening Post cover. And you can see that the woman has recently given birth to a baby. And you'll notice the husband is not there supporting his wife, um, you know, with the Lamaze breathing, um, certainly before that time. The husband is at home. He's wearing an apron. He's happily receiving the news that he has a child. Um, but you'll see he's made a mess of the house. The dishes have piled up in the sink. Um, there's trash all around him. So we have the notion that really in this image, women are the only ones capable of domestic tasks and that men are not up to the task of managing a home. Um, so that's a really interesting message. We looked at this picture last week, but this is what I end this part of the lesson with. Um, and recall that we looked at it and we saw that it's a, it's a double cover. So this would have been the front and then this side would have been folded under and you would pull it out. Um, and it shows the working woman fantasizing about a peaceful life at home while the wife at home is dealing with a crying baby and a husband who doesn't help out. He's watching TV and dishes piled in the sink and she's dreaming of a peaceful life at the office. So we really see the conflict in women's thinking about whether or not they should be at work, they should have a career, or whether or not they should be at home. Um, 
and we see that tension in American women's lives. At this point in my lesson, I bring in primary documents. So I really start tying in what we've seen in images and in our image analysis to the larger concepts in my American Studies classes. And so we look at an excerpt from Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique, which is a really important work from the mid 20th century that talks about how women are not, not satisfied with their lives as sort of household and domestic servants to their husbands and their children. Um, and we also look at a speech from Vice President Adlai Stevenson that talks about how women, it's, a, it's actually a commencement address to uh, graduates at Smith College in which he says that women serve the country if they fulfill their domestic tasks. And so with the integration of all of these different images, the photographs of Levittown, the song from Malvina Reynolds, the cartoons, the propaganda posters, the magazine covers, the photographs, um, students not only get an, an understanding of what um, women and society are dealing with in terms of cultural standards in the 1950s, but they actually get to draw from what they've already learned from the 19 teens, the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 40s as they build toward a new identity for American women. And so I want to encourage you to um, really think about how you can um, really pull from across different platforms of art. So think about music, think about advertising, think about um, uh, propaganda posters, think about the you know, more established forms of artwork like sculpture and portraiture and architecture and think about how you can use that to build a really fuller picture, a more full picture of um, whatever content you're teaching in your classes. Because as many of you said in your personal experiences with bringing in these different curricula into your normal content area, you feel like it gives students more depth and it helps them improve their analytical skills and it helps them engage with the material. Um, and so it's really easy to um, you know, use what the internet gives us and uh, what Google gives us um, and really draw on those resources to give students tangible things that they can hold in their hands or they can see on the screen that give them sort of a touchstone to culture. And that's certainly one of the things that social studies classes are trying to do. It's one of the things that art classes are trying to do. Um, and you even saw in your computer class that it was um, something that helps students engage with technology. So I think um, it's great that you were able to apply those lessons in your classes. Um, we have 30 minutes left in our time here, guys. And I'd really allocated that for our other folks to share. Um, and they're not here to share what they, what they um, did because they've lost their internet connection. So, um, Jeff, is it appropriate to go ahead and end the broadcast? Okay, since we weren't able to, to get a full picture from Jordan Matthews, um, I guess we get to leave 30 minutes early. Um, <laughs> So um, maybe that's happy for us and, and sad for them because I know um, we would have liked to have heard um, what they did and they did some really interesting things. Some of them also um, had tie-ins to Native Americans. I know Leanne, who's from North Chatham Elementary, did a really interesting thing on Cherokee abstract art. So I'm sad that she's not going to get to share. Um, does anybody have any questions here before we end our broadcast? Okay. Uh, we have one question. Sure. How can we get lesson plans from other teachers to uh, be shared with us? Okay, um, I can definitely do that. Um, I will have Carol send out um, or maybe post to the message board the other lesson plans that teachers send in. So I will definitely do that and I'll have Carol um, send you an email with um, where to find that information because they really came up with some neat stuff between Krista's use of music um, and Leanne's Cherokee abstract art and your portraiture and um, the, the other Native American things that we saw. 
there's some really interesting things. Um, so, so I'll definitely do that. That's a great idea, Henry. Any other questions? Is there any way we can see this broadcast uh, through United Streaming or any other way? Are we going to be able to post missed? this on the stream, Jeff? Okay, so we're live streaming and then it will be archived in our stream. Do they know where to go to, to get the streaming video, Jeff? Okay, I'll have Carol, there's a website where we record all of these enrichments um, and you can um, watch them as QuickTime videos on your computers. So I'll have Carol send that information out as well with the, where to find the lesson plan information that teachers sent in. Any more questions? All right, great. Well, it was um, really nice to meet all of you, and I'm so excited that integrating other curricula into your classrooms um, seems to have been a beneficial experience that helps students engage, that helps students improve their analytical skills. Um, and help them think in an interdisciplinary way. So I'm really excited that this went well. Um, and if we don't ever meet again, I hope you have a great rest of the year. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.